Hi, I'm Admiral, and in this video I'll once again be returning to the Pokémon Explained series. A few people commented on the last entrant into the series, regarding Eevees, Ivies, and Natures, asking for me to make the next one, so today I'm happy to bring you all an explainer on breeding. Please do try to be somewhat normal in the comments, and I know that's asking a lot for some of you, but it'll make my life so much easier. As always, I'll be breaking this down using the tried and true method of the WAWA. What it is, how it works, and the ways that we can use it to be better players. We'll start with the what, and if you haven't had the talk with your parents yet, this is your sign to stop the video and ask them where babies come from. If you have, then you already have an idea of what's going on here. Two Pokémon enter, three Pokémon leave. Or in this case, two Pokémon and an egg. The birds and the beedrills, if you will. Which, while certainly not an original joke, is one I feel somewhat obligated to make. I'm not sure if I can go into any more detail about this without getting my channel nuked, so I'm gonna stop here. So, you either know what sex is or you don't, but either way, that's essentially the what of breeding. Now we're going to get into the how. Breeding is a feature with a ton of mechanics built in, so this section of the video is going to be incredibly dense. To start, again, avoiding the X-rated details, for Pokémon, breeding usually requires two things. One male Pokémon and one female Pokémon, and for those two Pokémon to be of at least one matching egg group. I'll get more into egg groups in a second, but for now, let's talk gender. Gender is, simply, whether a Pokémon is male or female. This affects a surprising amount of mechanics in the games. Certain Pokémon can only evolve if they're of a certain gender or have different evolutions depending on their gender, certain abilities have different effects based on the gender of the opponent, and Attract will only work on Pokémon of the opposite gender. While gender and sexuality are a spectrum for people, it's apparently far more straightforward and heteronormative for Pokémon. Except it's not. You see, not every Pokémon has a gender. Magnemite's evolution line, Beldum's evolution line, and Ditto are all examples of genderless Pokémon, which means that gender-influenced abilities and moves fail when used against them, and that kind of makes sense. But how do those Pokémon breed? The answer is actually really simple. Ditto. Ditto is a Pokémon that's basically the Shohei Otani of breeding. If it can be done, Ditto is able to do it. A genderless Pokémon can breed with Ditto, and only with Ditto. In fact, the only Pokémon that Ditto can't breed with is itself. It can breed with any gender of any Pokémon, and it can do it without worrying about egg groups, with one big exception. Which, you may notice, is the perfect segue for me to talk about egg groups so I can explain that exception. An egg group is essentially a classification of Pokémon based on their physical attributes. Much like their type, a Pokémon can belong to one or two separate egg groups, though these don't always seem to make sense. A particularly popular, or perhaps notorious, example of this is the Field Egg group, which has a whopping 278 Pokémon in it, containing both Skitty and Waylord, meaning that those two can breed. Trying to figure out why a whale is in the Field Egg group to begin with is beyond my pay grade. You know, since I don't get paid for these videos. Anyway, it's for this reason that the Birds and the Beedrills joke is not only overused, but also inaccurate. Beedrill belongs exclusively to the Bug Egg group, which contains exactly zero bird Pokémon. It's also why that fan art of Lopunny and Gardevoir that you keep stashed in a hidden folder on your computer is actually pretty accurate, as both belong to the human-like egg group. Baby, Legendary, Mythical, and Paradox Pokémon, alongside Ultra Beasts, all belong to the No Egg Discovered group, which is just a handy distinction for Pokémon that, for some reason or another, can't or shouldn't breed. Also in this group are all cosplay and hat Pikachu variants, because it's weird to be born wearing clothes, Nidorina and Nidoqueen, for some reason, the Galarian fossil Pokémon, since they're abominations affronting both nature and god, and Gimigul and Goldengo, which I assume is just because Gimigul isn't a standard encounter, which affects Goldengo by extension. This egg group is the exception that I mentioned before, the only group with which a Ditto cannot normally breed, because these Pokémon, by necessity, are unable to breed at all. With one exception. Again. There are a surprising number of exceptions to established rules in breeding. One last thing to note for the breeding essentials is that your Pokémon need a place to get to business. From Johto to Kalos, alongside Fire Red and Leaf Green's Kanto, that's the Pokémon Daycare, 
where you leave two Pokemon to get experience and, if they're compatible, an egg. In Alola and Galar, there's a Pokemon Nursery, which just removes the experience mechanic to focus on breeding. In Paldea, all you have to do is start a picnic and any compatible Pokemon in your party will get busy, with no input required from the player. However, egg power sandwiches increase the rate at which eggs will appear in your picnic's egg basket. Now that I've talked about the criteria for breeding, let's get into the mechanics. And boy oh boy, there are a lot of mechanics. Breeding is essentially a mostly predetermined wild encounter, as the game generates some aspects of the soon-to-be-hatched Pokémon at random, while most are taken from the parents. This is the part of the video I'd like to call, What to Expect When You're Expecting, since I'm going to be talking about what's actually going to hatch from your egg. The species of Pokémon is determined by the female parent, or if you're like me and prefer not to think about egg groups in the slightest, or are instead trying to breed a genderless Pokémon, the non-ditto parent will determine the species. The egg will always contain the most junior member of that species' evolution line. Prior to Generation 9, Pokémon with babies in their line had to hold species-specific incense for a baby Pokémon to come from breeding, but that mechanic has thankfully been removed. Also, the fact that baby Pokémon are their own classification is why I'll be using the more neutral terms of offspring and child going forward to distinguish between actual baby Pokémon and regular Pokémon that happen to be freshly birthed. This way, you'll never have to guess what I mean. There's another species-based mechanic to talk about before I can move on. Two species have different forms based on the gender of the Pokémon that affects the species' outcome of their breeding. Nidoran male and female, and Volbeat and Illumis. In these niche cases, which one you get is complete coin toss. For example, a female Nidoran that breeds with any compatible Pokémon will have an even chance of producing either a male or female Nidoran as offspring. The same holds true for any male Nidoran, any Nidorino, or any Nido King that breeds with the Ditto, since any other Pokémon would default to the mom species. The same setup holds true for Volbeat and Illumis. Illumis with any male has a 50-50 to be a Volbeat or an Illumis, and a Volbeat with Ditto does the same. Essentially, since the gender is randomly assigned, so too is the species. Next, we have to talk about regional forms and how they work for breeding. A Pokémon with a regional form will always produce offspring native to that region. For example, a Paldean Wooper, Pooper if you will, that breeds in Paldea will always produce a Pooper as offspring. A Quagsire or Jotonian Wooper that breeds in Paldea will also always produce a Pooper as offspring. However, a parent with a foreign form, that is, a form not of the current region, can hold an Everstone to ensure that its offspring matches its form. So. A Quagsire breeding in Paldea while holding an Everstone will produce a non-Pooper Wooper. The same logic holds true for Pokémon like Galarian Weezing or Galarian Rapidash. As long as you can get your hands on an Everstone, you can have any regional form you'd like, so long as you have access to it already. A child can also inherit non-regional forms from their parents. Here, I'm specifically referring to forms not determined as a part of battle, like Cherim's Overcast and Sunshine forms, or, again, by region. Form inheritance is determined by the mother's form, or the form of the non-ditto parent. Rockruff with the ability Own Tempo are treated as a form inheritance instead of an ability inheritance, since that ability is specifically tied to its Dusk form evolution. And, of course, there are exceptions. Rotom always hatches as its original form. Furfro always hatches in its normal form, and Sinistee and Poltergeist always hatch in their inauthentic forms. There is also some funky stuff with Vivalon's pattern, but that's exclusive to the 3DS and involves the actual geographic location of the save file, so who cares? There's one last weird case, and that's Fiony and Manaphy. The reason they're so odd is because Manaphy is the only Pokémon whose offspring is a Pokémon that doesn't evolve into it. On top of that, these two are the only mythical Pokémon that can breed at all being outside of the No Egg Discovered group and both only producing Fiony as offspring. This is what makes them the exception I mentioned to the mythical Pokémon being unable to breed rule that I established back when I was talking about egg groups. Which is pretty neat, I guess, but luckily, that's all of the quirks of how the game determines exactly which Pokémon will hatch from a given egg. Now that you have an egg and a rough idea of what kind of Pokémon will be inside, let's talk about actually getting it to hatch. Each species has what's called an egg cycle, which determines the length of its incubation period. 
you progress an egg cycle by walking with the egg in your party. Depending on the generation in which you play, an egg cycle can be 255, 256, or 257 steps, with 257 becoming the standard from generation 5 onwards. Once you complete an egg cycle, the step counter resets until you've completed each egg cycle required for the species inside, at which point the egg will hatch. Reducing one egg cycle also knocks down the cycle of every other egg in your party, and in games that have one, will randomly determine whether or not a new egg is available at the nursery slash daycare. There are a few ways that players can reduce the time required to hatch their eggs. For one, you can ride a bike, which doesn't have a mechanical change, but just makes the player character take more steps in a shorter amount of time by moving more quickly. Also, starting in Generation 3, specifically Emerald, Pokemon with the abilities Flame Body or Magma Armor, or Steam Engine starting in Generation 8, being in the party alongside an egg will knock down the egg cycle counter by 2 instead of by 1, so you're essentially hatching eggs at double the speed. This effect doesn't stack with itself or with the same effect from other abilities, so you can't load up on warm Pokemon to hatch eggs insanely quickly, but it's still one of the most helpful mechanics, especially if you're doing a lot of breeding. And now that we know how to get an egg, which Pokemon you're getting from an egg, and how to actually hatch the egg you receive, we can finally talk about the way the game determines the offspring's attributes, including its stats, its nature, its moves, and even its Pokeball, through a system of inheritance. We'll start with moves, since there's a bit more to talk about in terms of inheritance. Each Pokemon species has what are referred to as egg moves. These are moves that can be passed down from parent to child and are sometimes learned exclusively from this method. Before Generation 6, only the father could pass down an egg move, but that's since changed to allow both parents to pass down moves. The actual process for this is pretty simple. If a parent knows an egg move, the child will know it as soon as they hatch. The child will also receive any of its normal moves known at level 1. On top of that, any move that is in the child's level up moveset that both parents also know will be in the child's moveset when they hatch. This means that, in theory, you could hatch a Pokemon that immediately has access to Belly Drum and Earthquake, or something like that. This has led to a process referred to as chain breeding. This is essentially breeding a bunch of egg moves onto Pokemon from different egg groups to allow a final desired Pokemon to get egg moves that they normally wouldn't be able to access through direct breeding because of incompatible egg groups. This could be pretty time consuming and research intensive, since you have to make sure that every Pokemon is compatible from start to finish, and that none of the chaining partners have egg moves that they could also pass down, muddying the process. But it can lead to some pretty impressive movesets once it's all said and done, and is obviously made harder based on how many egg moves you need to have on the final offspring. There are also a few ways to transfer egg moves to Pokemon that have already hatched, but only in Generations 8 and 9. In Generation 8, if two Pokemon are left in the nursery, and one Pokemon knows an egg move that the other can learn and doesn't have, and the Pokemon receiving the donation has an empty move slot, it'll come back to you knowing that egg move. In Generation 9, if a Pokemon with an empty move slot holds a Mirror Herb and attends a picnic with another Pokemon that knows an egg move it can learn, it'll learn that move at the conclusion of the picnic. Next, I'll talk about stats, and I've actually already talked about this in my video about EVs, IVs, and Natures, which I recommend you watch if you're confused by what I talk about here. This is different from generation to generation, so I'll give an overview of how this works currently. Offspring will always inherit three IVs, individual values, from their parents. That's three total, not three each, from different stats and random parents, so the remaining IVs will be randomly generated. Having a parent hold a Destiny Knot will change that to 5 IVs instead of 3, and parents can hold power items, usually used to train effort values, to force IV inheritance in the corresponding stat. So, for example, if one parent holds a Destiny Knot while the other holds a Power Bracer, the offspring will inherit 5 total IVs, one of which will always be the attack IV of the Bracer holding parent. The other four will be chosen at random for inheritance, and the last will be randomly generated. You can also have your Pokémon inherit a parent's nature, and it's actually done just like breeding for regional forms. Whichever parent holds an Everstone will have their nature passed down. This mechanic, just like IV inheritance, changed a lot between generations, and even between games in the same generation, so this is just true for the current generation. If both parents hold an Everstone, the child's nature will always be inherited from their parents, but the game chooses which parent at random. 
One final piece of information to note is that even if you change a Pokemon's nature with a mint, its original nature is the one that the game will pass down through breeding, since mints only change the Pokemon's stat distribution. Parent abilities are up for grabs too, with ability inheritance introduced in Generation 5. When breeding without a ditto, the mother's ability is the only one that can be passed on, with an 80% chance of inheritance. Breeding with a ditto just defaults to the non-ditto parent's ability. For hidden abilities, this drops to a 60% chance with the same criteria as before. The mother or non-ditto Pokemon must have the hidden ability for this chance to occur. Like I said before, children can even inherit their parents' Pokeball, for some reason. For Pokemon of different species, the child will inherit the mother's Pokeball. For example, a female Skitty stored in an Ultra Ball that breeds with a male Wailord stored in a Great Ball will produce a Skitty and an Ultra Ball. For Pokemon of the same species, the child has an equal chance of inheriting either parent's ball. When breeding with Ditto, the child will always inherit from the non-Ditto parent. The exceptions to this rule are the Master Ball, Strange Ball, and Cherish Ball. With these, the game just treats them as regular old Pokeballs for the purposes of inheritance. There's one final mechanical aspect of breeding to talk about before I get into the ways that we can use it to our benefit, and that's breeding for shiny Pokemon. There are two main factors determining shininess in bred Pokemon, the shiny charm and the Masuda method. The shiny charm, introduced in Black 2 and White 2, is a reward for completing the Pokedex that increases your chances of encountering shiny Pokemon in the wild and through breeding. The actual factor of increase changes between generations, so just check which game you're playing to know the exact odds. Named for Junichi Masuda, a founder of Game Freak, the fan-named Masuda method refers to a substantial increase in shiny odds available exclusively through breeding. Two Pokemon from different language regions will have increased chances of producing shiny offspring. This effect stacks with the shiny charm, so players can get their odds down to 1 in 512 with both effects active. It's important to note that Gen 9 sandwich effects don't impact breeding odds at all, so you shouldn't waste ingredients on shiny hunting from eggs. I honestly had no idea that there were so many intricacies involved in breeding, but I'm happy to report that we're finally over the hill of how and into the wonders of the ways we can improve. The biggest perk of breeding is the degree of control that players get over their Pokemon. A sufficiently competent player can create just about any kind of Pokemon they want with enough time and effort. And the nice thing is that once you have one part of the equation squared away, you can generally move on to the next. For example, once you have a Pokemon with all of the egg moves you want, you should be able to keep breeding that Pokemon until you have a favorable nature and the egg moves you want, since the moves will always be passed down, and then you can work for IVs, and so on and so forth. That is, at the end of the day, what breeding comes down to. Learning how to breed Pokemon effectively will give you the most possible control over your encounters. Customizing Pokemon, even down to shininess if you have friends from other countries, isn't just for hackers. You can do it too. I'm not sure that it's possible to eliminate all of the RNG from the breeding process, but it's certainly possible to get the Pokemon you want with the right setup and with enough rerolls. Of course, that's not all that breeding is good for. If you're struggling to find the first form of an evolutionary line, you can simply breed the later stages and be done with it. That's part of how I completed the Pokedex in Scarlet. Slackoth doesn't appear even after an hour of searching? Just breed two slacking and move on with your life. Easy. And even if you're not interested in breeding designer Pokemon, getting a ditto from another region, language region that is, not a Pokemon region, is a wildly effective way to shiny hunt for those of us that don't have the ingredients for shiny sandwiches, or who simply aren't playing Gen 9 right now. In fact, I remembered while writing this that I have a Japanese ditto in my version of Sword, and I'm very much going to download Pokemon Home to bring it into Paldea so I can Masuda it up. And that just about does it for breeding. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. I don't have any ideas for another Pokemon Explained video right now, but feel free to leave a comment suggesting mechanics or concepts that you're struggling with, and I'd be happy to consider making a video about it. Even if you don't have a question about breeding or Pokemon, consider leaving a comment anyway. Your feedback lets me know what you like, and constructive feedback lets me know how I can improve. My next video is going to be a randomized Emerald playthrough, because it's been a few months since I last played a Hoenn game, and I'm in need of a fix. I'll be working on the non-Pokemon video I've mentioned previously in the background, and this will be the last you hear about it until I actually make it. 
I also have some Lethal Company highlights from playing with friends that may get uploaded publicly instead of his unlisted videos, so I hope you'll keep an eye out for those if you're interested. I may also end up doing a video where I go through the process of breeding an ideal Pokemon at some point, and that can get moved up in my schedule if enough people ask. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.